what I would do is ask you, sir, from Louisiana. I'm giving you the to power. Search, you're presenting, to search it's you, sir, with your, with from Louisiana, positive. to search your heart and, and understand why the EPA knows that toxic petrochemical facilities My are some of the lady. most toxic, I, polluting trying, facilities in the, the floor, world boo. and are killing black people throughout Louisiana. Okay, so my so first thing would to be with you to search your you heart consume. and ask your God what you are doing to the black That's and our poor God. people no in about Louisiana. That. You know, uh, that would be my first thing to ask. Just... And it's people like you, sir, I do not have respect for. You talk about putting the border up in the wall. That's nothing new. It's another way of being racist. But you don't believe in rule of law. You believe in your kind of... Uh, it's, it's about hold, enough hold on, that. hold on, hold on. Is there any other municipality in these United States that has access to our seat of government as the citizens of Washington, D.C.? Actually, they all have more access because they have voting members of Congress uh, I'll, and I'll ask senators. you to restrict your answers to my question. Bum, is there any other city in the country where you're going to just bump into potentially hundreds of congressmen and a hundred senators at any given restaurant or grocery store? Is there any municipality in the country that offers that level of personal access to the seat of government of these United States? Congressman, I've already explained um, that I'm born and raised here, and I've spent most of my life here. I've been serving in elective office when for you were growing up. Years. Did you bump let me into just let me just officials? finish, Congressman. I'm reclaiming I my have time, never been to an event where I happen to bump into a hundred senators. You've lived here. <laughs> Arise in support of HR 192, an act to prohibit individuals who are not citizens of the United States from voting in elections in the District of Columbia, our nation's capital. D.C. residents should be confident that their local government vote is not being diluted by non-citizen residents or illegal immigrants casting votes. The critical point everybody needs to understand is that the District of Columbia has no voting representation in the House of Representatives, nor does the District of Columbia have any voting representation in the United States Senate. Um, and their legislation doesn't apply even to their non-voting delegate in the House, nor does it apply, of course, to presidential elections. So what we're talking about is, should these 500 or so people in the District of Columbia be allowed to vote for advisory neighborhood commission, school board, and members of the DC council and mayoral election. Very well, Mayor Bowser, you are the mayor of, of Washington, DC, correct? I am. And Washington, DC is the capital of the United States of America, correct? It is. The capital is the home of the entire seat of our government, the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, president is here, the vice president is here, 435 congressional offices, 100 senate offices, the Supreme Court, all departments of the government are headquartered here, all agencies are headquartered here. You had opportunity to have personal interactions with the entire seat of the United States government as a resident of D.C. that a resident of, say, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or Phoenix, or any other municipality across these that you didn't have. Now, the founders did discuss this heavily, and I, I ask you as very respectfully, are you, are you familiar with those discussions and the significance with which the founders placed the, the status of our nation's capital? I know that the founders were very concerned about being surrounded by jurisdictions that might overtake the seat of the government. Do you share that and concern? Absolutely not, because what we've seen is the federal government grow in size and scope that threatens to overtake us, and we saw it. We witnessed the federal government trample ask, on our autonomy question. and our safety. This is some of the most outlandish testimony I've witnessed yet 
in six years in this oversight uh, committee room. I'm not quite sure, I mean, with, with all due respect to our, our panelists today, I'm not quite sure some of you are connected to reality. What would you do with petrochemical products? Like, everything you have, your clothes, your glasses, the car you got her on, your phone, the table you're sitting at, the chair, the carpet under your feet, everything you've got is petrochemical products. What would you do with that? Tell the world. If I had that power in the world, what, actually, I don't need that power, because what I would do is ask you, sir, from Louisiana. I'm, I'm going to give this young lady an opportunity. You might not like it, but America needs to hear it. You've got no answer, do you, young lady, about what to do with petrochemical products, so I'll move on. What are you going to do with ocean-going vessels? What do you do with the maritime industry? Well, we could, I, again, I would ask you to search your heart for what is happening on you the coast no of Louisiana. Of course we like, do. You, you, we need to move away this, from petrochemicals. We need to shut down the petrochemical facilities in your state and move the, away the from run. plastic. We need the to move away from function. it. You and couldn't there be are it's insane. It is what would you do with the aviation industry? The only industry? thing that would not function is the petrochemical industry in your state, sir. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you care about the planet, good lady? Like, do you have ecological concern for real? Like, from a biblical perspective, we were, we were given, we, we were given, the Lord gave us dominion over the planet and the creatures thereof. Now, the original translations of dominion means to care for and nurture. So from a biblical perspective, I am an environmentalist. I love my planet and the people and the creatures thereof. Do you? Sir, if I'm we're going to you, talk about if we're going to talk about the Lord, I ask that you search your heart again and think about repenting. I search for it very quickly. I love the planet. I'm you, asking you, you, do you the do fossil you fuel industry that owns your state is destroying the earth and the natural world, and that is a fact, sir. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen's recognized. And I rise today to oppose H.R. 192, uh, yet another attack on home rule in the District of Columbia. Um, I wish we were here today talking about climate change, uh, which is a dagger at the throat of humanity. We've seen record drought in the Midwest, record forest fires in the West, record flooding in the East, hurricanes of record velocity in the distinguished gentleman from Louisiana's beloved Gulf Coast. There were mosquitoes in the North Pole last summer. The sea levels are rising everywhere. Um, but we're not here to talk about that emergency. I do have a book for my friend, uh, Mr. Higgins, called Bayou Farewell, written by one of my constituents about what's been taking place on the Louisiana coast that I'm going to offer to you today. But we're not talking about climate change. We're not talking about gun violence, despite the fact that America now has rates of gun violence and gun-related mortality 20 times higher than the nations of the European Union. Uh, gun violence is now the leading cause of death among children and young people under 18 in America. It's out of control. But we're not talking about that. We are exercising our constitutional authority, as my distinguished colleague from Louisiana says, uh, to oversee the District of Columbia. And here today, what's caught our eye is that they have uh, legislation which passed, uh, which has become law in the District of Columbia, which allows permanent residents and other non-citizens to register to vote. So they have nearly a half million registered voters in the District of Columbia. 512 of them are non-citizens. Uh, around a, a little bit more than one-tenth of 1% 1 of registered voters are non-citizens. Their primary election in 2024 has already begun. Uh, the DC voters got uh, their ballots or began receiving ballots in the mail on April 29th, and the district has already begun accepting ballots. Um, 
the DC Council had transmitted the local resident voting rights amendment act of 2022 to Congress for the required review period on January 10th, 2023. Uh, the House passed a disapproval resolution, as my friend mentioned, on February 9th, 2023. The Senate did not pass the disapproval resolution there. The act became law in March of 2023. So what we're talking about now is passing legislation to overturn a practice that is literally taking place as we speak within the District of Columbia. The practice of non-citizen voting, uh, my friend may be interested to learn, is one that actually was adopted in the vast majority of American states at different points in American history, including, I checked, in Louisiana, uh, where it existed for around a decade. Um, and um, it started, as far as I could tell, with this basic premise that when the country began, there was a race qualification, there was a gender qualification, there were property, wealth, and religion qualifications in different places. But the basic logic of it was that if you are a white male property owner, it doesn't make any difference what your citizenship status is. And that lasted really uh, up until the Civil War. The practice of alien suffrage at the local level was one that became hotly contested before the Civil War. The Southern states opposed it because they said that the immigrants who were coming in, who were being given the right to vote, were anti-slavery. They were abolitionist. The Northern states, and specifically the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln, defended the practice of non-citizen voting. This was a, a major bone of contention um, geographically, sectionally in the country with uh, legislation like the Kansas-Nebraska Act and other uh, admissions, uh, statehood admissions struggles. Well, when the South seceded from the Union and wrote um, it, their own constitution, the very first article of the Confederate Constitution banned the practice which we're discussing in a very modified form today. They banned anybody from voting in the Confederacy who was not a citizen of the Confederacy. When uh, the Union won the war and the secession was put down, alien suffrage spread across the country. Uh, again, the Republican Party championed it, and they championed it in the form of something called declarant alien suffrage, which is for people who were permanent residents of the country who were on the pathway to citizenship, they were given the right to vote, especially in a lot of the Western states, as those states tried to attract population uh, westward. The practice appears to have been diminished and eliminated in a lot of places uh, around the turn of the 20th century and before World War I. Um, and it survives today uh, in the form that the District of Columbia has fastened onto it for local voting on the theory that you want people at the local level to be involved in their kids' schools and you want people to be engaged in local government. We ban non-citizen voting at the federal level, which means we also ban it at the state level because they're linked constitutionally in Article I. Um, so what we're talking about is non-citizen voting chosen by a local government at the local level simply for municipal uh, elections.